Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Live from Boulder, Colorado and Bluffton, Georgia. This is Will Harris with our Gussie's Got podcast. How you doing, Mr. Will? I'm doing great, Rob. Proud to be here with you today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I uh, want to start off by saying this. Uh, we Together, we've done this really cool collaboration partnership. Um, and <clears throat> I believe, uh, I tell me what you think of this. I believe we've, we've entered in the around 2020, we started entering into this collaboration era where I, I like to say that collaborations are the new currency. And, uh, you and I have done this treat together. Uh, you've been uh, wonderful. You and Jenny have worked really closely with, have been really great to provide us with your amazing heritage pork. And together we've created with our fermentation and a little bit of honey, uh, Manuka honey, uh, we created this amazing treat called Guttables. So um, what do you think about, how do you think about collaborations? Well, I think, I, you know, <clears throat> We, we never really got away from it. You know, the small town, intimate, we, we, you know, what we know of each other, we've known for generations all the way back. So uh, I, I say we didn't get away from it. I mean, I got bankers and people that, that I do business with that are strictly by the numbers, but the, yeah. the real human side of relationships it has always been here for, for, for us. Yeah. 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 And I'm just glad that a lot more people are adopting it. And uh, I, I, you know, it's what makes business fun, you know, because you get to, you know, if you, you spend a lot of, I know you do, I do spend a lot of time working. Uh, we're, uh, you know, I was talking to Jenny and, you know, we're wired to work. And so if you're going to spend this much time working, you might as well do it with who you enjoy working with. And, and the other side of the coin is if it's somebody that you can't work with, you need to go ahead and recognize it and, and just embrace it, you know, the, both ways. We, uh, you know, we, we tend to, to categorize uh, people today that, and, and it's, just, it's just not that way. You know, we're as, as different and as individual as, 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 as could possibly be. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> this is for, for me, for the, for the company, uh, for my company, it's pretty full circle because one of the big goals of mine, Will, was to use this company to pull in uh, biodynamic regenerative. Organic is the bottom line for us, but, but, but that's been so diluted and bastardized that really what we're about is a higher level than that, which is biodynamic, or in this case, especially regenerative, both uh, meat and vegetables. So um, this is a really, a, a thing, a really cool thing for me, because now I get to buy thousands of dollars worth of incredible product from a, from a great business. And together we can create this thing that is bigger than its parts. The sum of it is bigger than its parts. Um, do you want, do you want to tell me a little bit about, I, I want to talk about the, your heritage pigs, your, your pork. Can you tell me a little bit about your pigs? Sure. So, uh, this farm, when my great grandfather established it in 1866 had hogs and cows and sheep and goats and, and other species, vegetables, and operated it that way for a couple of generations, my great-grandfather and grandfather. My dad turned it into a monocultural cattle operation. It was post-World War II, and that's what you did post-World War II. And it, and it, was, uh, it worked well for him economically. He was financially successful with it. Yeah, uh, I went to the University of Georgia, came home and ran it as a monocultural cattle operation for 20 years and was very happy for a long time doing it. It's all I ever wanted to do. Yeah. But saw the uh, 
became, became increasingly aware of the unintended uh, consequences of that operation. That monocultural operation started moving back into a uh, an enterprise that looked a lot more like what my great grandfather and grandfather had than what my dad had and I had had. And uh, part of that was adding other species. When I uh, I was a monoculture cattle operation, what that meant is there were things in the pasture they didn't eat. The cattle just don't eat that. And when I sprayed it with herbicide, it was okay. When I quit using herbicide, having those weeds in the pasture were a problem. So we got sheep, and then we got goats, and then later we got hogs, and later we got poultry. We just kept adding species because nature avoids a monoculture. Nature doesn't want one species out there living uh, by itself. We want so a number of different species living in symbiotic relationships with each other. And pigs were part of that, and they become an essential part of it, and we really enjoy having hogs on the farm. Kind of interesting, you know, hogs, nor cattle, nor chickens are indigenous to this ecosystem. We brought them in, but they, they fit into it beautifully. Nice. Yeah. Those, you mean like uh, in the like wild in Georgia? Well, there are wild hogs in Georgia, but they, they did not come from this ecosystem. Hogs came from China and Europe and, and other ecosystems. Mm. were brought in here. Uh, actually, I think the Spaniards brought the first hogs in here. Uh, live hogs. Yeah. So, you know, I I was there not very long ago, a few weeks ago, uh, on the on the farm, and I was with the pigs, and um, you know, I it was a lot cleaner and neater than I thought pigs lived. I always thought pigs. <laughs> You know, just lived in a bunch of junk and muck, and you know, wh- wh- how? Why is that different uh, over at White Oak Pastures? Well, we, we give them an ecosystem to live in. You know, pigs, uh, even pigs in a confinement cement pen, which is a very unnatural environment. So, ninety percent of the hogs in this country are raised, but they will do their uh, urination and defecation in one corner of it. They, they, they tend to want to not sleep where they poop. Uh, but we, they can't get far from it because in those little pens, of course, in, in the situation where we put them, uh, we put them in a, uh, on a piece of land and uh, with knowing that they're going to impact it, rooting it with their snouts, rooting it up. But with the intention that when they impact that land sufficiently, we move them to the next piece and the next piece, and the next piece. It's very uh, intentional, it's very planned, and it has a lot of benefit to the land and to the animal. Yeah. Forgot the young lady's name who runs your pig operation. What was her name? Who went to pigs? Uh, She's amazing. Oh, you're my Jess. Yeah, Jess. Jess, yeah. She's uh, she's great, yeah. Yeah, she's she's great. great. She was talking about how you guys have the the slivers the the you know the triangle formation yeah. what yeah. a what a bunch of intention and thought that's been put into that that's exactly right that's 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 what i was describing to you it, it, it's a, so a wagon wheel design we put yeah. the feed and water in the middle then we branch off from it but we only give them like one slice of the pie at the time by the time they make it all the way around, they're they're finished, ready for slaughter, yep. and we'll move it to another place. And we won't have it there anymore for a generation or two. All right, so... Human, a, human, a human generation or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk real quick about your book. I got your book and your audio. Um, I don't know what I like the most. Maybe your audio I like it most, uh, probably because I know how much work you put into it. Um uh, tell me, I don't think I've heard anybody ask this before, so forgive me if they have, but a bold return to giving a damn. So what have we lost? What, what, what is the giving, uh, wh- what have we stopped giving a damn about? You know, I think in the case uh, that that was reference to our farm or, and I think that what we, uh, 
<clears throat> quit giving a damn about is the cycles of nature and embracing the cycles of nature and operating this farm as a symbiotic operation that generates uh, wealth, a return by, by maximizing the cycles of nature. The cycles of nature for us are, to name a few, the energy cycle, the mineral cycle, the water cycle, the microbial cycle, the animal grazing cycle. All of these cycles, when uh, allowed to manifest themselves properly, generate a, a, a return. All that, all that oil and coal and natural gas in the ground, that's the benefit of the cycles of nature, the abundance that came from the cycles of nature during the dinosaur era. And, and what we eat from our farm is the abundance of nature from this current era. <clears throat> but we've gotten away from that in modern agriculture. And, uh, and we have intentionally moved back to it. And we just, we just like it so much better. Yeah. I just was talking to a really good friend of mine, a, a brilliant holistic vet in the UK named Dr. Nick Thompson. And he's a big fan of your book, big fan of white oak. I don't think he's had any white oak, uh, product yet, uh, being in the UK, but, um, he is a big fan of regenerative. And we were talking about the importance of the nutrients coming out of the ground and the soil, the, the health of the soil and how that translates into muscle and organs and, you know, sinew, you know, tissue, cartilage, all of that health. What do you know about that as it relates to what the quality of the soil, how that translates into the final product that you, you know, bring to market? Well, I think that when we industrialized agriculture, we tried to make things so much more simplistic. And today, we don't we don't think much about the natural fertility of the soil. We think about buying nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and a small handful of other uh, elements that are put into chemical fertilizer that are put out there. Yep. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work is there are microbes that pull minerals out of rocks and stones and exchange it to the plant. There's literally an exchange. The microbe pulls the iron and phosphorus and potassium out of the rock. It trades it to the plant for uh, glucose. It's a chemical exchange. And, you know, when I was at the University of Georgia, nobody knew that. Nobody knew that. And when I learned it as a, as a mature adult after operating the farm for several years, it was just incredible to me. What? But it makes so much sense, and it's so beautiful. And when yeah. we use chemistry, laboratory chemistry, to... Uh, take the place of that things go missing it's just as simple as that yeah it's it's not not as perfect and also what's interesting is like what you're doing as beautifully as you do it you're all you're trying to do is mimic nature you you can't duplicate it you know we you're trying about, to we talk about emulating nature all the time and and, and we're imperfect yeah. You know, we're, it's not perfect emulation, but it's the best we can do. And it's a heck of a lot better than the uh, laboratory science that we used to embrace. Yeah. You talk a lot also about external costs. And, you know, we've been, especially in this, well, this country, UK, Australia, we've been trained to we don't recognize these external costs. We pay them, you know, it's, everything's on the layaway plan um, in our lives. So we get these cheap burgers at a fast food place or, you know, in the grocery store, the per pound costs are a lot less. Um, tell you a funny story real quick. Um, <laughs> the person who is in charge of my treats, uh, making our treats, she got, uh, you know, she's seen pork prices before 
and uh, she got our shipment from you guys. And she said, I saw the the bill and I said, this must be a mistake. We, <laughs> this, is, this isn't the right price. I said, no, that is the right price. That is the true cost of pork. And I, I just thought it was interesting that everybody in the whole production process and thinking about, you know, how how much something is, we're all just trained to think things are less and, and, um, and we don't think about any of the, any of the back end costs. So how do you think about external costs or how can you explain that to, to people? Yeah. <clears throat> I think about that a lot. And that's an excellent point in the industrial model. We have externalized so many costs from the cost of production. You know, and there are many examples. One I like to use is, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, the, 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 the watershed that I'm on goes to the Gulf of Mexico. Yep. It goes from Devil's Branch to Spring Creek to the Chattahoochee River to the Gulf of Mexico. Yep. And there's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that's as big as the state of Connecticut. And there was a thriving oystering business down there from the era of wooden ships until just a few years ago, a moratorium was put because the oyster population had plummeted, not because of overfishing, but because of pollutants coming down the Chattahoochee River, Flint River. So you know, that is an externalized cost, the loss of that, that oyster industry. An industry is an externalized cost of using chemical fertilizers and pesticides on crops. But the manufacturer of the pesticides didn't pay it. Nope. And those of us that use the product didn't pay it. It's just out there. And it would cost tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to clean that up. You know, microplastics in the environment. Uh, they tell me that you can find literally uh, chemical pesticides in the poles. Yeah. You know, they, they weren't used there, but they wound up there. You know, uh, how about how about a, a, a species that's driven into, to being extinct? What does that cost? I mean, what does that cost? The fact that there aren't any more of them. Yeah, and that species had some role here, didn't it? Yeah, but it's not here anymore, is it? No. So all these we we can go on and on. All these costs that we incur making obscenely cheap food are there. It's just not in the price of the obscenely cheap food. Yeah. I'll give you another big one. Cancer. Yeah. And, you know, they just, they distribute it to each family. So each family's devastated. You know, one of the biggest, one of the biggest causes of bankruptcy is medical costs. And it's on the, you know, all these companies, these big you know, whether they're conventional farming or ranching, um, they've just decided to distribute those costs across, you know, millions of people. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a sad story. The climate, you know, climate change in general, you know, what is, what is, a, what is a good hurricane cost? Yeah. What about a, a huge forest fire? Yeah. You know, these are costs that we have incurred that don't go back directly to those of us who, who incur the cost, it goes yeah. to society. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's flip the, go back to the way that it should be and regenerative uh, ranches. We'll, we'll focus on the ranching. What does, you know, you've, you've said very clearly publicly that white oak pastures could not feed the world. Um, and that's not your role. And I think that's really wise to the way you think about, you know, trying to serve more local, but also if you, if you send it out, you know, you, you're not going to be able to send it out to the world. So when people look for local grass fed or regenerative, uh, ranches, what should they be looking for exactly? The, the, uh, at first it needs to be as local as it can possibly be. And, you know, I realize the scope and scale of this country, and I realize it might not be just right down the road there. It may be in the next state or something, but as local as it can be. You know, we ship product to 48 states. We don't want to. I, mean, I, I, I do it because I need the business, and I can't sell enough 
locally, so I'm, I'm willing to do it. That's not the way I envisioned it in my mind. Yeah. You know, I, want, uh, I, I want there to be as many of us as there can be, yep. serving as many of you as they can everywhere that they are. Yeah. And you were one of the, is it true to say you were a founding member of the grass fed association? Yes. Okay. My, 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 my membership number is 0001. Right. Literally. Cool. Well, you should have, you probably should have made it 007, but that's okay. Double triple O one is cool. Um, what about, what about them? What are they doing? That is why are they needed? in the world yeah well i think that they got a couple roles one is education you know they uh, they help people learn how to uh, raise beef non-industrially and other proteins too started out beef but now they have in pork and other other species and there's also a, uh, a certification side of it and i'm not real big on certifications in general but you got to have something and I think that what they've got is is good. So it's a it's a good organization. There there are other good organizations out there as well. Good. Can you name them? Uh, you know, I'm afraid I'll leave out somebody. <laughs> but uh, it's true. Understand, yeah. Understanding Ag has a, a good program. Uh, Savory Institute, we mentioned earlier, has a good program. And then there are others. Again, they 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 popped up pretty well. I don't want to leave anybody out unintentionally. But there are a number of programs out there. Uh, I will say that I'm as, as I have gotten older and further into it, I am less and less a uh, uh, proponent of certifications in general. I really like, I really think in a, in a, in a better world, I won't say perfect, better world, it's more important that the consumer know who their their provider is and know something about them. And I say that for several reasons, but the main one is there there are also some low hanging fruit certifications out there. Hmm. And I, I, I won't name them, but when a consumer goes to the grocery store and sees it's certified, if their bandwidth is so narrow, they say that's good. And I think that that is best altered by no knowing having some actual knowledge of your farm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I know what, which ones you're talking about. Um, one of the what do you think about the demonization of cows and methane, and how how do you think about um, that in the big scope of like? The planet. I think it is incredible, and I think it's intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ruminant. Let's you can talk about cows. Let's just talk about ruminants. Yeah. You know, cattle are not indigenous to North America. Buffalo were, to 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 a great extent, the cattle have replaced the buffalo in terms of their role with the impact on the environment. So. You know, the role of, of, of ruminants, cattle, sheep, goats, buffalo, is to harvest grass. And it's just incredible, Rob. You know, they, they, they cut that grass with their teeth. Those, those bottom teeth are like razors. They cut that grass and they swallow it whole. And it goes into a section of their stomach. People say cows have four stomachs. No, no, no. They have one stomach with four sections. Yep. And it... It's microbially broken down. Later on, they, they, they burp it back up, chew it, swallow it again. Ultimate, ultimately, it comes out the back end of that cow as the most perfect microbe feed on the planet. I mean, you, you, you can't in a laboratory make a microbe feed that's any better than that cow manure or sheep manure or goat manure or buffalo manure. The, uh, they drop it on the ground, and the microbes in the soil, which are first cousins to those microbes in the gut, start to work on it. Insects like dung beetles start to work on it, and it breaks it down just so beautifully. I mean, it's just so beautiful. It's, it's just exactly the way it ought to be 
that we can't emulate it otherwise. Yeah. But we so but we've demonized it. We and we've demonized it by. And we we did not sh- enclose cattle and feed them corn to demonize uh, that, but that but we did it. We did it for economic reasons, and it served as a great opportunity for the people that wanted to demonize cows to point it out and say it's an ecological nightmare. It's it's just a beautiful thing ecologically. Yeah. Uh- our veterinarian, Dr. Ian Billinghurst, he's a agronomist. He's been at this for uh, over 50 years. Uh, probably one of the first vet nutritionists in terms of pets, dogs, cats. And uh, he says often what goes, what comes out at the other end is more nutritious than what comes in from the front end in the mouth. And dogs, I don't know if you know this, but dogs are... Um, what they call, um, uh, what is that word uh, that I just, uh, caprophagic. So they, that means they like to eat poop. Yeah. Simple. Any poop, chicken poop, mm-hmm. horse, cow, dog. Uh, and they know, you know, and you, you have dogs, you know, that they know exactly what it is they need. And they, they go and they pick and they, you know. And what we also know is all these dogs that you hear stories about Guinness Book of World Records, or, you know, you'll see a story in People magazine about the longest living dog. They're all dogs that are living on land. You know, there's no dogs living in a condo in Chicago that is living at 25 or 30. And so what we're trying to do as a company is the same thing you're trying to do, which is mimic nature as best as we can. And so we took that sliver of the caprophagia, the, 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 the part of the dog that likes to eat grass or eat other animals poop. And we said, what if we made a optimized version with organic or better produce, we fermented it and then we freeze right into a powder. And in our case, between us, we made it into a treat. And so that's all we're really trying to do is we're trying to mimic nature a little bit and bring nature into your home a little bit easy, make it a little bit easier, especially for, you know, the folks living in cities. It's pretty funny how we we spend so much energy doing that, right? Well, it may be all you're trying to do, but it's a, it's a very noble thing that you're doing. And uh, it's, it's funny you told that story because for years, because you, you're right, I do have dogs. There's a dog living right over there. And when we go to the pasture, you know, they, they will eat manure. It's just as simple. And I know what manure they're going to eat. And I can look at it and tell that's that's manure. That the, the dog. And they go up and, and eat and I eat a little bit of it. And I have a uh, a friend, uh, uh, an urban city dwelling friend who was here with me and he had his dog, went to the pasture. My, we got out. My dog went to a manure pile and started eating. And he said, what's wrong with your dog? I said, nothing. He says, eating manure. I said, I know it. What's wrong with your dog? It's not eating manure. And his dog looked terrible. My dog was beautiful. But yeah. it, it's, it's the way it is, the way it's supposed to be. I think what you're doing is brilliant because while I do understand and respect my dog eating manure, I do not like for him to lick me in the face after he's eaten manure. So with your, with your product, you you avoid that. Yeah. Yeah. Better. Manure. Yeah. I, I will say this about our product. It does give dogs better breath. That is for sure. Yeah, you uh, my, 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 my product, my dog does not. Yeah. Look, I, I, I can't, I, I can't honestly tell you. I, I think I think the manure on your fields is better than our product. When you look at you know what is happening and the the quality of the grass you grow and the the soil health, and then the natural fermentation the cat the cow does, it's brilliant stuff. But we try, you know, we're trying to to make this thing easier for people who just don't have access to a beautiful farm, you know. Um, so, like. Let's go back to the cows and the demonization of we'll, we'll focus on cows, ruminants. Um, the same thing is happening, Will, in pet food. It's starting to happen. So we're now starting to talk about 
oh, gee, how much meat is are our pets eating? And what are we, there's that same conversation going. And so I, I, what do you think about the, um, the way that the markets are, are, I don't, I don't know if I should say markets. I, I guess it's the, uh, the, the powers that be that they, they're starting to manipulate how people think about, you know, uh, nutrition. I mean, you know, I don't know where this is going, if this is going in terms of like, they want to feed dogs bugs or just mealworms um, or, or bot fly, you know, uh, soldier uh, uh, larva, whatever it may be. Um, but it's not their, their species appropriate diet, isn't their ancestral feeding. So um, do you think, do you see any, do you know anything about that? Well, I don't, I certainly don't know anything about it. I certainly have ideas on it. I've been watching it for a long time. And, you know, the people who uh, captains of industry uh, have increasingly had more and more and more control, smaller and smaller numbers of them. And if you look at the food business today, you know what those numbers are probably better than I do. But it's just a handful of companies, maybe seven or eight companies that are feeding us, you know, in meat, there's about four that's feeding us. So, and you know, the same would be said with cereals and everything else. You've seen the charts that show who owns who, and, and, and they're all owned by a very small number of, of, of entities. And, you know, they're all very profit driven, understandably. I don't think that's evil, but I think that when you uh, have so few of them, you're leaving the free market enterprise system because it's, it's an oligopoly and the messaging is controlled. And I think that that's uh, as much control as these companies have, the small number of, of companies has over the food supply. They still don't have uh, full control over the farming side. It's just, it's still, there's too much land that's got to be owned. And even they don't have enough money to own all that land. So I think that uh, uh, controlling the food so that it is less dependent upon land and animals puts it more, the ball more in their court of what they can control and profit from. And, uh, and I don't think it's good for, the, for the land or the animals or the people that are consuming it, but it's good for the companies that are making a lot of money uh, producing f food for us and put food in quotes. Yeah, yeah, and centralizing it and controlling. Did, did you know that? Did you know that that if you go to the grocery store and buy a certified organic tomato, it may have been raised inside a building in an aqueous or in, in water well not only that you've got organic now ap applies to hydroponic so you know tell me where that makes sense there's no soil involved right you know one of the things we along those lines we talk about a lot is <clears throat> they change the ruling for mandatory country of origin labeling and today you can buy uh beef in the grocery store, this label product of the USA, but it was born, raised, and slaughtered in Uruguay or uh, Australia or uh, Argentina, or in, uh, no, 20, 20 other different countries. It could have been, but it, it was a product, it's a legally sold product of the USA, just so intentionally misleading. <clears throat> so, uh, we uh, have had uh, a lot of people come here through the years for training and education uh, for our intern program, and th things evolve and evolve. And we reached the point that the numbers of people that were coming here for education was just overwhelming to us, and we had to have some rules. So we sat down and formed and uh, started the formation, only formed a, a 501c3 called CFAR, that's the acronym, Center for Agricultural Resilience. And the purpose of CFAR is to train uh, consumers and farmers. It started out 
farmers, but consumers seem to to uh, enjoy being here too. So, but to train them in how we do what we do here. There are, are, are classes on uh, cattle production, hog production, sheep production, the sheep under solar voltaic, which is adds another dimension to it. All the things that we do here have classes. I think we're probably having 20 or so per year and uh, it's financed through CFAR. It reached a point that I just couldn't afford to do it anymore. So we formed CFAR to allow people to make charitable donations to continue the educational effort. And it's been overwhelmingly successful. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, lucky enough to go it, to do one of your intensives there on the farm. And it's uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of good information. And you have this, you have a really robust um, apprenticeship program or what do you, what do we call that? Apprentice? Yeah, well, an intern program, but it's an it, 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 apprenticeship is fine. And we take uh, seven or eight uh, people a year. I almost say young people. Some of them are not young. But yeah, we, we've had we've had interns here who are as old as I am. But we bring them in four times a year for three months, and um, and then, you know that that's not complete farmer training. I tell them when they come, don't expect to be able to leave here and go somewhere and farm. It won't be like that. But it's a great introduction. And often they wind up staying here uh, beyond that. This has been really, really good. The uh, We also have, I'll, I'll just throw this out, uh, a really talented young woman that runs these programs for us, particularly CIFAR, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Carly Redding. And she does a fantastic job mentoring these people. She really gets to know them and find out what's important to them and give them guidance on be, and helping them be where they need to be on this farm. Yeah, yeah Dr. Redding's amazing. So the treats that we created together, what the goal of this for me was to further to build more regenerative farms and and therefore and the way to do that is first with education. We're we're obviously very committed over here to, on, on the education side. And so our goal with these treats for those listening is to launch this product and and do a very heavy donation, which we'll announce later to CFAR to then increase more farms um, all over the United States and the world. You, you have people from all over the world, right? We do. We have them from a, no, a number of countries. Yeah. yeah. And, and, all, and, and, you know, surprisingly few uh, from the South. You would think because we're here in Georgia that it would be very heavily Southern oriented, but we've had them from, uh, I, I should have them look, but pro probably darn near every state in the union. Yeah. And a lot of, a very high incidence of non-farm kids. These are not, the, the, the great part of them are not uh, sons and daughters of farmers. That uh, they're, they're people that came from more urban areas that, want, that are interested in this regenerative kind of food production. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah, the uh, like a few of the people in our class were yeah, they were like real estate people and you know, your typical business people. It's very interesting. We've had we've had PhD literally had PhDs that uh came through our program in something that's not soils. They've been uh, they just they just wanted to uh restart more or less. Wow. So what well, what do you do to what do you do to relax and and don't say drinking? I do drink, <laughs> but that's not what I do to relax. Uh, you know, I, I think I, I mean, I, I just got such a good job. I mean, I love what I do. You know, we, you know, I, I tell I, I tell my family I work half time. I work twelve hours a day, seven days a week. That's half the time. But I don't ever, I all, almost never do anything I don't want to do. I just, I am deliriously happy. I, 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 I'm, I couldn't have, I couldn't ask for a better job. You know, we're, we're sort of not rich financially, but it's a very rich life. Yeah, I mean, I'd say so, and I, that's that's exactly, I think, the right way to uh, 
the right way to be people, you know, people, if you can find something that's, that you're so passionate about that you just, you love to get in, in it and you love to, you love the people you get into it with, uh, man, that is, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, isn't the key to life at some point, like you have, a, you, you have a finite amount of time to live, but we know that, but it's a, it's a good amount of time. And if you're not happy and you're not, um, learning and growing, it's a slog, man. Getting through this life is a real slog. So you got to like, you want to do it with great people. You're growing, you're learning, you're, you're enriched. I mean, I, I just think that's the only way to get, to get through this life, right? To, to be happy right. about it. I certainly feel truly blessed. I mean, I, if I can, uh, you know, I just hope I can uh, stay physically able to do this as long as I last. I don't pray to be older and older and older. Yeah. I just hope I'm able to do what I do until it's over and then let it be over. Yeah. 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 That's what, and that's what I say too about like our dogs is health span matched with lifespan. You know, you, you don't want to be outliving your health span at all. Uh, you know, you want to square that all the, all the best doctors, they talk about squaring the curve. So instead of that long decline of illness, you want to just go drop dead. Yeah. Boom. And I'm good with that, yeah. you know, but you want to have a nice, healthy, fulfilling life. So, um, all right. Well, look, I, um, I'm going to let you get back to your happy life and your, your enriched life and your, and I know that the animals need you. So, um, thank you very much for the time today and, and thanks for being a partner. Thank you for, for all you do for us and other pet owners. It's just really, it's, just, it's a great pleasure having you and our, our cast of friends. Thanks, Will. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. Have a great day.